Now, so far we have focused on the market system, but this system is actually only one half of the global economic paradigm. The other half is the monetary system. While the market system deals with the interaction of people gaming for profit across the spectrum of labor, production and distribution, the monetary system is an underlying set of policies set by financial institutions which create conditions for the market system among other things. It includes terms we often hear such as interest rates, loans, debt, the money supply, inflation, etc. And while you might want to pull your hair out listening to the gibberish coming from the monetary economists, modest preemptive actions can obviate the need of more drastic actions at a later date. The nature and effect of this system is actually quite simple. Our economy has, or the global economy, has three basic things that govern it. One is fractional reserve banking, but banks printing money out of nothing. It's also based upon compound interest. When you borrow money, you have to pay back more than you borrowed, which means that you, in effect, create money out of thin air again which has to be serviced by creating still more money we live in an infinite growth paradigm the economic uh, paradigm we live in now is is a ponzi scheme it's n nothing grows forever it's not possible as a great uh, psychologist james hillman wrote the only thing that grows in a human body after a certain age is cancer it's not just the amount of money that has to keep growing it's the amount of consumers consumers to borrow money at interest to generate more money and obviously that's not possible on a finite planet. People are basically vehicles to just create money, which must create more money to keep the whole thing from falling apart, which is what's happening right now. There are really only two things anyone needs to know about the monetary system. One, all money is created out of debt. Money is monetized debt, whether it materialized from treasury bonds, home loan contracts, or credit cards. In other words, if all outstanding debt was to be repaid right now, there would not be one dollar in circulation. And two, interest is charged on virtually all loans made. And the money needed to pay back this interest does not exist in the money supply outright. Only the principal is created by the loans, and the principal is the money supply. So, if all this debt was to be repaid right now, not only would there not be one dollar left in circulation, there would also be a gigantic amount of money owed that is literally impossible to pay back for it does not exist. The consequence of all of this is that two things are inevitable inflation and bankruptcy. As far as inflation this can be seen as an historical trend in virtually every country today and easily tied to its cause which is the perpetual increase of the money supply which is required to cover the interest charges and keep the system going. As far as bankruptcy, it comes in the form of debt collapse. This collapse will inevitably occur with a person, a business, or a country, and typically happens when the interest payments are no longer possible to make. But there is a bright side to all of this. Well, at least in terms of the market system, because debt creates pressure. Debt creates wage slaves. A person in debt is much more likely to take a low wage than a person who isn't, hence becoming a cheap commodity. So it's great for the corporations to have a pool of people that have no financial mobility. But hey, that same train of thought also goes for entire countries. The World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, which mostly serve as proxies for transnational corporate interests, give gigantic loans to troubled countries at very high interest rates and then once the countries are deeply in the hole and can't pay austerity measures are applied the corporations swoop in set up sweatshops and take their natural resources now that's market efficiency but wait there's more you see there's this unique hybrid of the monetary and market system called the stock market which rather than, you know, actually produce anything real, they just buy and sell money itself. And when it comes to debt, you know what they do? That's right, they trade it. They actually buy and sell debt for profit, from credit default swaps and collateralized debt obligations for consumer debt, 
to complex derivative schemes used to mask the debt of entire countries, such as the collusion of investment bank Goldman Sachs in Greece, which nearly collapsed the entire European economy. So when it comes to the stock market and Wall Street, we have an entirely new level of insanity born out of the money sequence of value. Uh, all you need to know about markets was written in an editorial in the Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago. It was called Lessons of the Brain Damaged Investor. And in this editorial, they explain why people with slight brain damage do better as investors than people with normal brain functionality. Why? Because the slightly brain damaged person has no empathy. And that's the key. If you don't have any empathy, you do well as an investor. And so Wall Street breeds people who have no empathy to go in there and to make decisions and make trades that they have no compunction about and no thought whatsoever as to what they're doing might affect their fellow human being. So they breed these robots, these, these people who have no souls. And since they don't even want to pay these people anymore, they're now breeding robots, real robots, real algorithmic traders. Uh, Goldman Sachs and the high frequency trading scandal. They, they put a computer next to the exchange, the New York Stock Exchange. This computer, this co-located computer as they call it, it front runs all the trades on the exchange and it hits the exchange with, with volumes of orders in ways that scalp pennies and nickels away from the exchange. It just, it's like they're siphoning money all day long. They went uh, one quarter last year, 30 or 60 straight days without a single down day and made millions of dollars every single day. Is that because well, that's statistically impossible? When I worked on Wall Street, the way it works is everyone kicks upstairs the bribes. The brokers bribe to the office manager. The office manager bribes to the regional sales manager. The regional sales manager bribes to the national sales manager. It's a common understanding. At, at Christmas, who gets the biggest bonus at Christmas in an average brokerage office? The compliance officer. The compliance officer sits there all day long. He's supposed to be making sure you don't violate any of the margin rules and you're complying with the law. Of course, yeah, to the extent that you can bribe the compliance officer, yeah, that's right, you are complying with the law. So how does fraud has become the system? It's no longer a byproduct. It, it is the system. You know, it, it's like that old Woody Allen joke. He says, doctor, my brother thinks he's a chicken. And the doctor says, take a pill, and that should cure the problem. And he says, no, doctor, you don't understand. We need the eggs. Okay? So... The trading of fraudulent claims back and forth between banks to generate fees, to generate bonuses, has become the, the GDP producing growth engine of the United States economy. Even though they're essentially trading fraudulent claims that there's absolutely no hope of ever paying back. They're processing and generating and resecuritizing nothing. If I write $20 billion on a cocktail napkin and I sell it to JP Morgan, while JP Morgan writes $20 billion on a, a cocktail napkin, and we swap those two cocktail napkins at a bar, and we each pay ourselves a quarter of 1% in a fee, uh, uh, we make a lot of money for our Christmas bonus. We each have on our books a $20 billion cocktail napkin, which has no real value until such time as the system is no longer able to absorb bogus cocktail napkins, and in which case we go to the government to get bailed out. And because of Wall Street and the global stock market, there are now conservatively about $700 trillion of outstanding fraudulent claims known as derivatives, still waiting to collapse, a value amounting to over 10 times the gross domestic product of the entire planet. And while we have seen the bailouts of corporations and banks by governments, which of course comedically borrow their money from banks to begin with, we are now seeing attempts to bail out whole countries by conglomerates of other countries through the international banks. But how do you bail out a planet? There is no country out there that isn't now saturated in debt. The cascade of sovereign debt defaults we have seen can only be the beginning when the math is taken into account. It has been estimated in the United States alone that income tax would need to be raised to 65 percent per person just to cover the interest in the near future. Economists are now foreshadowing that within a few decades 60 percent of the countries on the planet will be bankrupt. But hold on, let me get this straight. The world is going 
bankrupt, whatever the hell that means, because of this idea called debt, which doesn't even exist in the physical reality. It's only part of a game that we've invented. And yet the well-being of billions of people is now being compromised. Extreme layoffs, tense cities accelerating poverty, austerity measures imposed, schools shutting down, child hunger, and other levels of familial deprivation, all because of this elaborate fiction. What are we, fucking stupid? Hey, hey, Mars, my man. Help a brother out, huh? Grow up, kids. Saturn, what's up, man? You remember that smoking nebula I hooked you up with a while back? Uh, listen, Oith. We're getting really tired of you. You've been given everything, and yet you waste it all. Yeah. You got plenty of resources, and you know it. Why don't you grow up and learn some responsibility, for Christ's sake? You're making your mother miserable. You're on your own, pal. Yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.